Hello friends, welcome to EPG Patshala. I am Dr. Anureka Chariwag, Assistant Professor at the Department of Sociology, Savitri Bhai Phule, Pune University. Today we are going to discuss a module titled Typology of Prison Movements. This module is part of the paper titled Agrarian Relations and Social Structure in India. This module is coordinated by Dr. Manish Thakur of IM Kolkata. In this module, we are going to look into four important areas. First, what is the uses of typology? Second, why do we need a typology? Third, what are the typologies of prison movements that has been developed by various scholars? And fourth, what are the limits of typologies? Typology of prison movements. Introduction. Historically, a wide variety of prison movements have characterized the Indian landscape. Some of these movements have witnessed mass violence, whereas some others have been part of the general mobilization characteristic of the Indian national movement. Moreover, there have been differential participation of different agrarian classes in these movements. These movements also differ in the scale of mobilization, the levels of political awareness, strategies and goals and objectives. True, most of these movements have been localized phenomena. Yet the resonance of the present discontent and general causes of the misery have found articulation in the nationalist agenda and the development policies after independence. The plethora of legislative measures to achieve land reforms can very well be seen as a political response to popular upsurge of the prisons exemplified in various movements. You have already studied some of these movements in considerable detail in the previous models. You would have also realized that prison movements have been studied extensively by scholars belonging to different disciplines. Sociologists and historians have generally taken the lead, now they have been joined by other social scientists as well. Substantive studies of particular prison movements apart, some of the scholars have developed strategies to make sense of a wide variety of prison movements by developing typologies of different kinds. This module intends to introduce you to some of these typologies. But if you, before you go further into the various forms and bases of classification, we think it is appropriate to let you a little bit more of the functions of the typology as such. You will find it perhaps useful and worthwhile exercise to dwell upon the nature and the need of typology in social science. The need for typology. A typology is an attempt at a structuring social reality and perceiving it through categories in order to achieve a clear and precise understanding. In fact, the grouping and classification of objects into distinct set or types, it is also inculcated as a basic human activity from childhood and marks a growth of more complex behavior patterns. In an essay by Durkham and Moss published as early in 1903, there is a suggestion that sociology needs to develop a branch of study called social morphology. Those whose primary role would be to develop systematic classifications of social types or species in relation to social structure. Presumably, this would allow sociology to develop as a scientific discipline as well as avoid problems that arise due to oversimplified understanding of social phenomena. According to these theories, types are just more than just logical categories, they are effective collective symbols of classification. Sociology must also be concerned with natural typologies that are symbolic classification of entities into types of four classifications that are found in various societies for they reflect the conditions of human subjects and self. Typologies thus occupy a very important place in concept understanding that they bring a certain order within empirical science. Since science is grounded on the assumptions of orderliness of natural phenomena, and rational apprehension of this order by man, the systematic classificatory grouping of phenomena and explication of the rational for the classification are indeed tantamount to the existing codification of the existing state of knowledge in a discipline. This discipline resort to typologizing because it encourages precision and makes a body of knowledge scientific. According to the International Encyclopedia of Social Sciences, the methodical function and significance of typological classification are basically twofold, namely codification and prediction. Typology goes beyond sheer description by simplifying the ordering of the elements of a population and the known relevant traits of that population into a distinct grouping. In this capacity, a typological classification creates order out of the potential chaos of the distinct discontinuous or heterogeneous observation. But in doing so, coding phenomena, it also permits the observer to seek and predict relationships between phenomena that do not seem to be connected in any obvious ways. 
In other words, with the potential for codification, prediction, and precision, typology enables the making of a more scientific social science. This penchant for typologizing phenomena is an attempt to be scientific, thus betray a positivistic urge among the sociologists. As the goals and frameworks of the discipline undergo change, sociologists today have moved away from the imperative to typologize the phenomena that they study. Nevertheless, as mentioned earlier, typologies and typologies of prison movement in our case have their uses and it is worthwhile to know about them. Social movements are basis of typology. Prison movements are about social movements. The preliminary way to of understanding prison movements is just to look at them in terms of social movements. So you will be given a short introduction to the typologies of social movements before you start looking at typologies of prison movements in India. Social scientists have used a variety of ways of creating typologies of social movements. According to Rao, the, the social movements have been classified according to various criteria. The classification poses definitional problems. Thus, classifying movements on the basis of the consequences constitutes one form of classification. Therefore, we have reformist movement aimed at bringing about change in some area of life or the other involving new relationship activities, norms and values. Other movements which are labeled as transformative are those which bring about change in relationship between superordinate and subordinate. Still other movements work towards bringing about revolutionary changes in different spheres of life. In general, movements may be classified according to the locus or segments of population, sector or setting in which they originate. Accordingly, we have movements which are classified as linguistic, religious, sectarian, caste, peasant, worker, tribal, etc. This criterion thus enables us to understand the section of the society which is involved in the movements. Movements may also be classified on the basis of the scale and breadth. Accordingly, some of them may be all India, others may be regional or local. However, according to Rao, the uh, criteria of ideology and the nature of consequences are critical in defining the nature and scope of the movement. While the locus provides the substantive aspect, the criteria of ideology mm, and consequences provide the analytical foci of the movement. We come across another form of classification on the basis of change orientation of the social movements as suggested by Partha Mukherjee in his study of the Naxalbari movement. He says that social changes can be understood as changes occurring within the given structure, changes occurring from an emergence of an additional structure, change occurring due to elimination or loss of a structure and changes occurring as a result of replacement of existing structure by an alternative structure. Uh, from the above changes of the first variety could be classified as accumulative and those of the second and the third variety is as alternative whilst the changes of the fourth type are transformative. Likewise, Umen on the basis of his study of the Bhutan Gramdan movement puts forth threefold classification of movements, charismatic, organizational and ideological. In this classified scheme, the emphasis is on the prime mover of a movement that is what propels and sustains a movement and mobilizes the rank and file. For example, given the charismatic role of Vinoba, the Bhutan could well be regarded as a charismatic movement. And Naxal movement on the other hand will be an example of an ideological movement and prison movements launched under All India Kisan Sabha would be the case of organizational movements. Moreover, the, these are heuristic categories that the same movement can go through these places, phases in its life history. How can this be seen in relation to the Bhutan movement? We should also remember that none of the typologies suggested here are beyond criticism. Of necessity, they stress on certain attributes of a movement that they consider to be important. In the process, certain other attributes which are the scholars may treat as equally important, if not more, may not find resonance in a given typology. Typology of prison movements. Scholars who have studied prison movements in India have classified the phenomenon along several axes. According to Shah, so far as prison movements are concerned, classifications on the basis of movements, chronological emergence in different periods of history has been quite popular. Therefore, we very often refer to prison movements by the rough historical periods such as prison movements in pre-British India, prison movements in the colonial period and prison movements in the post-independence India. Prison movements in the post-independence period again have been classified as pre-Naxalbari or post-Naxalbari or pre-Green Revolution and post-Green Revolution. 
Obviously, in this classification, axial body movement or green revolution is a moment of great historical significance as far as changes in the agrarian social structure are concerned. The latter has been further divided into movements occurring in the pre and post emergency period. Observers of the agrarian scene have termed movements occurring in the post green revolution period as farmers' movement. This replacement of the peasant by the farmer, however, is not an arbitrary choice on the part of the scholars. There is abundance of literature to justify this conceptual shift in terminology. The shift in the nomenclature is also indicative of the shift in the nature of the demands, ideological orientations, the emergence of new actors in the countryside, and the changing social class character. More importantly, it has been demonstrated by the researchers that the issues and demands of the farmers' movement primarily reflect the class interest of the rich farmers who emerged most strongly in the post-green revolution period in certain parts of the country. You can read Dipankar Gupta to have a detailed account of the Bharatiya Kisan Union movement in western Uttar Pradesh. In characterization of a movement as a farmers' movement, a set of larger theoretical issues are at stake. The nature of agrarian capitalism, the place of free and free labor in Indian agriculture, the role of Indian state and its disposition towards agrarian bourgeois, depending upon the changing character of the ruling coalition. Brass is a good source to understand some of the larger issues from an orthodox Marxist point of view. Interestingly, Gail Omweit has classified the peasant struggles into old and new, whereby the former is known by the term peasant movement and the latter by farmers' movement. To her, farmers' movement exemplify new social movements in the Indian case. For a distinction between old and new social movements, you can refer to the relevant modules on the paper on social movement. Guillaume may claim apart there is no denying that farmers' movements have, may have certain distinguishing features even when the addressee for both the peasant and the farmers' movement continues to be the state. Farmers' movements generally display utter indifference to the plight of the laboring classes. Issues relating to general well-being of the land as agricultural labors hardly find any place on the agenda. In fact, it is the ownership of land that qualifies one to the status of the farmer. Moreover, the sectional demands of the class of the owner cultivators turn to be the general demands of the entire rural population. This gives the impression of farmers constituting a homogeneous class and thereby is under place internal differentiation of the class of the farmers in terms of caste and their differential access to land. Focus is generally on the access to resources provided by the state such as subsidies on power for irrigation, fertilizer, pesticides, insecticides, and agricultural implements such as tractors and threshers, coal storage, minimum support prices, credit at cheaper rate, cheaper interest rates, etc. Farmers movement generally take the recourse to essentialize distinction of Bharat versus India, the former referring to countryside and later to urban metropolitan India. They claim that the development policies of the state tend to develop India at the cost of Bharat. They invoke in a popular language what economists call terms of trade, arguing that latter is biased against rural India. To put it differently, the farmers have to sell off relatively more quantity of food grains to procure a given piece of agricultural implement or given a bag of fertilizers from urban market. And the farmers movement have been demanding the rectification of the biased terms of trade through policies favoring farmers. In India, Shetkari Sangatna movement in Maharashtra led by Sharad Joshi, the Bharatiya Kisan Union movement led by Mahindra Singh Tikar in Western Uttar Pradesh are seen as textbooks cases for farmers movement. Scholars have also looked at Karnataka Rajya Rayata Sangha movement in Karnataka that was at its peak in the 1980s under the leadership of Professor M. D. Nanjun Swami. Most of these movements testify to the increasing country, town nexus and the growing hold of capitalist relations in Indian agriculture. Farmers are the ones who produce for the market as against peasants who are generally seen to be producing for subsistence and thus are intimately involved with the process of commercialization of agriculture and the vagaries of the global commodity production. On the one hand, this dependence on the market makes them prosper as an agriculture becomes a lucrative economic enterprise. On the other hand, it also makes them extremely vulnerable by exposing them to the global dynamics of agricultural commodity production, particularly cash crops. 
the incidence of farmer suicide and or the phenomena of bt cotton or monsanto have to be understood in this context of relation to the increasing reach and depth of capitalism in indian agriculture in a study of peasant struggles here they say classified colonial india into right wary areas and the british territory zamindari areas and the princely authority and tribal areas he felt that the struggle in these areas had a different character different goals and involved different strata of the peasantry this i call the struggles in the colonial period peasant struggles and those in the post independent period as agrarian struggles the usage of the term agrarian struggles is to indicate a broad category consisting of peasants and other classes in these struggles this i for the divided struggles in the post independence into two categories the movements launched by newly emerged proprietary classes comprising of rich farmers viable sections of the middle peasant proprietors and the landlords and the movements launched by various sections of the agrarian poor in which agrarian proletariat have been acquiring central importance Kathleen Gaon records 77 uprisings and cites massive historical data detailing tribal revolts during british rule these revolts were primarily launched by tribals who cultivated land and were already peasants in terms of the occupation Gaon classifies the uh, such peasant movement on the basis of their goal ideology and method of organization according to her there are five types of revolts first restorative rebellion to drive out the british and restore a ruler and social relations religious movements for liberation of a region or ethnic group under a new form of government social banditry terrorist vengeance with the idea of meeting out collective justice mass interruptions for the redressal of a particular grievance kancham shah is critical of the above classification because he feels it places undue focus on the goals rather than upon the nature of peasant actors involved or the strategies that they adopt in attaining their goals inspired by the framework of class analysis the andhanagre believes that peasant movement in india can be understood through the model of agrarian classes he draws upon and extends the marxist tradition of the study of peasantry in terms of agrarian classes As you already know, this tradition of understanding peasant stratification goes back to Lenin's classic work titled "Development of Capitalism in Russia." This was further enriched by contributions of the Chinese revolutionary leader Mao. Later, an entire subfield of peasant studies emerged along the lines of Marxist class analysis. D. N. Dhanagre's classic work on peasant movements in India belongs to this tradition. According to him studies of peasantry need to be both historical and comparative in nature employing the historical comparative framework Dhanagre analyzes a range of peasant movements in India between 1920 and 1950 such as the Mopla rebellion in Malabar the Bhaga movement in Bengal Bardoli satyagraha in Gujarat the peasant struggles of Telangana and out they established two broad patterns of interdependence between type of movement and strata of peasantry according to him poor peasantry generally participate in the insurrectionary and millerian movements and the rich and middle peasants on the other hand generally involves himself in the nationalist non violent resistance movements even now the nagre's typology of peasant movements in india is relevant More importantly, the Nagre advantage major revision of the middle peasant thesis in the Indian case. For the middle peasant thesis, you can refer to the other relevant module in this paper. Privileging goals and ideology and methods of the organization in its classification of peasant movements, the Nagre talks of the following type: nativistic movement or rebellious. They were primarily aimed at driving out the British and maintaining earlier ruler and social relations. Such movements are essentially revivalist in their ideology and is generally backward looking. These movements did take place in India in the 18th and the 19th century. Process of British annexation of Indian territory and the imposition of alien land revenue administration in different parts of the country saw the emergence of such movements. Religious or millenarian movements. These movements are meant for liberation of a particular region or an ethnic group under a new pattern of authority. the collective orientation is towards a futuristic region religious ideology totalistic goals of messianic leadership for example the santal rebellion in the chota nagpur plateau led by tribal leader birsa munda falls under this category social banditry this is a category drawn from the work of historian erikson 
It refers to rebellious activities of the present outlaws whom the Lord and the state regard as criminals. Social bandits remain within the bonds of his in society and are considered the heroes, leaders of liberation. They emerge in times of general peace and pauperization and economic crises such as famines, droughts, floods, and civil wars. Social bandits inhabit remote and inaccessible areas. Their goals are narrow and they exemplify Robin Hood syndrome. They would loot the granaries and the wealth of the rich peasants and distribute them among the poor. Even the Chinese revolution led by Mao had its share of social bandits. In India, the fictional works of Anishwar Nath Renu con contains references to some of the social bandits like Nakshatra Malakar in the Purnia region of Bihar. Mass insurrection Prison go for mass insurrection for the redressal of specific secular grievances. Such insurrections do not have a single charismatic leader. They may be initially reformative involving peaceful demonstrations, but they end up with mass violence. Tibhaga and Telangana movements in India are seen as mass insurrection. Terrorism This involves will use and threat of violence coupled with vengeance and ideas of meeting out collective justice to the chosen few. Terrorist acts by their very nature are sporadic, diffuse and spontaneous. Naxalbari movement in its phase of decline saw such terrorist acts through such doubt such acts also accompanied present rebellions and old and mopla revolt. Liberal reformist movements they involve violation of specific law through symbolic protest. They do not question the very structure of legitimate authority. Likewise, do not aspire for or aim at fundamental transformation in social relations. Prison movements in Kheda, Badroli, Champaran and Out fall under this category. In general, liberal reformist prison movements emerged as part of nationalist mass mobilization. They employ strategies such as no tax campaigns or they would protest against particular piece of legislation that they would consider exploitative such as compulsory indigo farming. The first two types of the above mentioned classification are transformative in the sense that they aim at total change while the last four basically refer to reformative partial changes, intrasystemic changes and modifications in the existing social relations. You should also realize that none of the prison movements in India seem to conform to a single ideal type and concrete reality. In fact, in their actual unfolding, some of these movements may have elements of more than one particular type. Uh, yet, heuristically, these types help us to understand the phenomena of prison protest. Complex social forces and peculiar historical conditions get the form and substance of prison resistance. In fact, most of the prison movements never assumed an all India character. They were fragmented either regional or local and were generally oriented towards local regional demands. In class terms, Narian and insurrectionary movements, principal participants are poor peasants, insecure tenants with small holdings and sharecroppers. Mass insurrections may have participation of landless laborers as well. Terrorism as a type witnesses the mobilization of the same agrarian classes as mass insurrection. What distinguishes these two types are the ideological differences. Some of the prison movements like the Mopla Rebellion and the Out Revolt in Uttar Pradesh have been regarded as pre-political in nature and given the dominant religious overtones of these movements. What makes prison rebellion a mass movement are levels of political mobilization and the degree of political consciousness. In this reading, Tibhaga and Telangana turned out to be overtly political prison movements as they involved revolutionary mobilization by the Communist Party of India. Thanagre's analysis clearly demonstrates that rich and middle prisons generally act either against the government or landlords. These categories also responded to Gandhi's call for political agitations for national independence. They also adopted his ethics of non-violence and peaceful satyagraha. Hamza Alvi relates the failure of Satyabhaga and Telangana movement to the presence of the poor peasants in, as a peripheral area. This movement also saw alienation of middle peasants in the later stages of the struggle. Dhanagari is of the view that middle prisons too are vulnerable and marginal to be considered as a revolutionary vanguard and revolutionary prison movement. They display withdrawal symptoms in the movement. 
Moreover, they are deeply attached to land and that too dependent on rich prisons for credit and other types of support to carry on with any revolutionary zeal. In fact, they did not make any outstanding contribution to the Mopla or the Tibaga insurrections. They are much closer to the rich peasants in terms of economic interest and political aspirations that has been supposed by the proponents of middle peasant thesis. Women observe that there are peasant movements that have been continued till today irrespective of the change in political power. The movement started during pre-independence period but they continue till today though the goals have undergone change. Shah feels that peasant movements differ according to the variability of agrarian regimes or structures as the latter undergoes changes and the nature of peasant movements also vary. For example, a contrast can be drawn between the two, between the actors and the goals of the peasant movement under British and those during the post-independent India where the nature of peasantry and the demands and the goals became more differentiated. In recent times, scholars also include the struggles of agricultural labor under the general rubric of peasant movement. After all, agrarian labor as a category is intimately linked with the general framework of ownership, control and use of land. Thus, Kannan divides rural labor struggles according to development of class consciousness among them. According to him, there are a protest movements based on caste or religious identity consciousness, but those which are basically a response generated by the emerging capitalist mode of production. And B. Secular movements arising from category A that reject caste identity and consciousness but appealing to the rationality and brotherhood of man. C. Nationalist movement culminating in the radical political consciousness, the seeds of which were in the category B culminating in class consciousness and class based movements. Another way to look at the peasant movements is the way Ranjit Dhanajit Kuha does in his book Elementary Aspects of Peasant Insurgency in Colonial India, where he examines peasant insurgency from the perspective of peasant consciousness for revolt. Guha delineates the underlying social, underlying structural features of tribal consciousness of peasants, namely negation, solidarity, transmission, territoriality, etc. These features can enable us to understand why and how peasants have rebelled in the past. However, Guha represents a more recent trend where scholars are moving away from typology. He believes that peasant struggles cannot be categorized because they have element of arbitrariness. Social reality is complex and it is misleading to divide them artificially. However, Guha's studies is confined to tribal rebels and to the rebellions that had occurred in the colonial period. Some of the Guha's collaborators, namely Gyanendar Pandey and Shahid Amin, now have worked on other peasant movements in considerable detail. Collectively, these gets were designated as subaltern historiography. The essential thesis of subaltern historiography poses the autonomy of peasant consciousness in terms of the political action, limits of typology. Although sociologists have devoted a lot of time to the creation of typologies, there are several limitations. Firstly, as mentioned earlier, the urge to create typologies that would enable generalization and prediction is little far-fetched because social re reality appears to be more dynamic to be enca encapsulated within such typologies. Secondly, some movements are participants from different strata of society. For example, if the issue of conservation of forests is raised by tribals, should the movement be treated as tribal movement or ecological movement? They can be regarded as both as sustenance of forests is important for the livelihood of tribals. Issues like ecology or civil liberties are not class-based movements, although they might affect some class of people more than they do others. Rao provides a balanced understanding of the act and purpose of classification when he rightly emphasizes that classification helps us to identify the main features of the movement. It does not fully explain consequences. Any classification is bound to remain inadequate or a movement tends to acquire new features during its course and any classification can only be relative to a particular phase in its development. In conclusion, students, there are four important issues that this module has raised. First, the importance of classification in sociological methodology and theorization, which is seen in the way various typologies of prison movements had been devised. Second, we need to have a preliminary understanding to different types of prison movements in India. Third, this module also has sensitized us to the larger issues of development. And finally, this module has sensitized us to the role of the state, especially with regard to the interest of the peasantry. Thank you.